So thank you very much for uh, coming to our uh, weekly uh, innovative discovery series. Just a few housekeeping issues. Next, the next, uh, uh, the next seminar next week will be uh, Maurice Simons, who's going to talk about occupational health. So occupational uh, epidemiology. So that's going to be very interesting. Please come. And don't forget to sign in. And I think it's uh, there is nothing else. Uh, so we are really delighted to, today to have uh, Dr. Farquhar here to give us uh, a talk on uh, the, the dietary sodium. We've known with Farquhar basically since we first came at SICO in 2005, and at that time we created a, a small but dedicated group meeting monthly to discuss translational research related to cardiovascular sciences. So Bill is now a professor in the College of Health Sciences at the University of Delaware. And since 2011, he's a chair of the Department of Kinesiology and Applied Physiology. He has a PhD in exercise in sports science and exercise physiology from Penn State and did a postdoc at Harvard Medical School in integrative uh, physiology. He has multiple and numerous publications in peer-reviewed journals as well as editorials, book chapters, reviews, op-eds, blogs, and he's not even a stranger to social media as he tweets routinely to the undergrad students with a theme uh, related with uh, uh, health-related information due to a physiology lens. I would love to see this too. I'm, I'm very admirative because I'm not, I'm not a tweeter. So the yeah. After this, I'll sign you up. Well, well, you can follow me after this. <laughs> uh, so Bill has a very active lab where he mentors undergrad and graduate students and has had multiple NIH grants over the years and is currently the PI on an R01 uh, which tackles is vascular effects of dietary salt in human with salt resistant blood pressure on which Paul Colm is uh, an investigator. Paul Colm is here. So welcome Bill and thank you so much for coming. Okay, thank you. I'm really glad to be here. I appreciate the um, invitation. So the title of my talk is Dietary Sodium and Health More Than Just Blood Pressure. Um, so here's my outline. And I want to first say uh, my outline comes from a review article I just worked on with my colleagues Dave Edwards, uh, Claudine, and also Bill Weintraub. Um, we published this review article in the Journal of, of American College of Cardiology in, 20, in this year, 2015. Um, so this talk is really, um, I'm speaking, but really is a team effort. We worked hard on this review article, and all the information in this talk um, comes from this review article. So here's my outline. First, I'm going to discuss salt sensitivity of blood pressure and the mechanisms of sodium-induced increases in blood pressure. Next, I'll talk about sodium and target organ effects. Then I'll move to um, dietary sodium bleep of blood pressure and cardiovascular outcomes. Um, then I'll discuss limiting sodium in the diet and then conclusions. So first, I want to define um, salt-resistant and salt-sensitive blood pressure. So this is um, very simply here. We have um, um, participants put on a low-sodium diet and a high-sodium diet. And these are participants that have come through our lab. And this is a controlled feeding study. And we measure their 24-hour urine. So on the low-sodium, as we would expect, it means they're following the diet. Urinary sodium excretion is quite low, and on a high sodium diet, it's quite high. And in, these, in this group of participants, this is young to middle-aged adults, normotensive. You can see there's no change in blood pressure. This is a 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure. So no change in blood pressure, despite a huge difference in um, sodium intake. And if we look at that with a, a renal function curve, here we have 24-hour mean arterial pressure graphed against urinary sodium excretion. You can see it's a vertical line, meaning we're going from low sodium to high sodium, yet there's no change in blood pressure. So that would characterize a salt-resistant blood pressure response. Now, just for comparison, a salt-sensitive response, if this were a salt-sensitive adult or a salt-sensitive group, the curve would go out this way, meaning we'd still, you know, we'd be increasing urinary sodium, but there would be an increase in blood pressure, so this bar graph would be higher. So that salt, this graph here is salt-resistant, and if it were going out to the right here, that would be a salt-sensitive blood pressure response. Now, what groups have salt-sensitive blood pressure? Well, um, Older adults tend to be more salt sensitive than younger adults. Um, hypertensives tend to be more salt sensitive. African Americans, those with chronic kidney disease, um, women with a history of preeclampsia, and also those with low birth weight. All of these things are associated with salt sensitivity or high salt sensitivity. Now, on the other hand, young adults, middle-aged adults, normotensive and Caucasian tend to be salt resistant. 
Now, does salt sensitivity have any clinical relevance? Um, this, is a, this comes from Weinberger. This was published in 2002 in Hypertension. And he tested a lot of people, several hundred people, assessing their salt sensitivity. And what he did was after he assessed their salt sensitivity, he also determined if they were normotensive or hypertensive. And he followed them for over two decades. And in this graph here, this is a 25-year follow-up, and here's survival. And the N represents normotensive, and the H represents hypertensive. And this is the classification at the initial testing. And again, they were just followed. And you can see the normotensives had better survival than the hypertensives. That's not surprising. But the, what was interesting here um, was that the salt sensitives had worse survival than the salt resistant. So up here, this would be a, a normotensive salt resistant. Their curve comes out here. And here's a normotensive. So this is someone with normal blood pressure at the onset, uh, but salt sensitive. You can see their uh, survival was far worse. So the best survival were the normotensives and the salt resistant. The worst survival were the hypertensives and the salt sensitive. And then this was a follow up of 596 subjects, 123 died. Um, now, what are the, I, I want to review just briefly the mechanisms leading to sodium-induced increases in blood pressure. Um, now, first, I have environmental genetic interactions here. So in this context, the environment is the exposure to sodium. And with genetics, I mean, we know salt sensitivity is heritable. Um, rats can be bred to be salt sensitive. And there are several genetic variants in the renin, angiotensin, and aldosterone system that are associated with salt sensitivity. And these come from the gen salt studies. But the point here is, is um, there are lots of mechanisms that may play a role in linking sodium to blood pressure. If we start with renal function, we've known if you go back to the 1960s from studies from Guyton and colleagues, um, what Guyton did was they, using an animal model, they induced renal dysfunction, reduced renal mass to, uh, by 70%, and then had the animal switch from tap water to a saline solution. And when you switch from tap water to a saline solution in these animals, blood pressure would go up. Switch back to tap water, blood pressure would go down. So that, that's um, volume-loading loaded, volume loading hypertension due to the expansion of the extracellular fluid volume. But those types of studies, and they also link up with studies in patients with chronic kidney disease, who also have high sensitivity. So that shows, at least in that context, in the model of renal dysfunction, that that's a, that, that, um, a contributing factor to salt sensitivity. Now, with regard to regulatory ho hormones, when you um, increase or decrease salt in your diet, you get a robust hormonal response. Renin changes, angiotensin II, and aldosterone changes. And there is the suggestion that those with a less responsive um, hormonal response tend to be more salt sensitive. And it's thought that this may play a role in the high salt sensitivity experience in African Americans. So for a given sodium load, the normal response is to suppress plasma renin activity, angiotensin II, and aldosterone. If you're not appropriately suppressing them, that may lead to a salt sensitive blood pressure response. Um, with regard to the non-renal vasculature, when you, increase, when you eat a lot of salt, you're expanding your extracellular fluid volume, and that can lead to an increase in cardiac output. And since mean arterial pressure is the product of cardiac output and total resistance, if you don't have an offsetting decline in resistance you know, from the smooth muscle around, around the uh, blood vessels, you're going to have an increase in blood pressure, a salt-sensitive response. Um, and finally, the autonomic nervous system. Um, if you measure plasma or serum sodium within an animal or within a person, and you switch them from a high-sodium diet to a low-sodium diet, you do see changes in plasma or serum sodium. Now, it's not a tremendous change, but if it's a within-subject comparison, you will see a change. And it's thought that that increase, if there's a chronic increase in serum or plasma sodium, that may be a signal to cause the brain to increase sympathetic nervous system activity, which would then subsequently increase blood pressure. And a lot of that work comes not so much from human studies, but more from rodent studies. But it's thought that the autonomic nervous system may be a contributing factor or may contribute to uh, uh, sodium-induced increases in blood pressure. Now, what you get is, so here we have, you know, the multiple physiological mechanisms, and ultimately we have an effect on blood pressure. And I presented very simply, we have salt resistant and we have salt sensitive. Um, however, there is a range of responses. I mean, here's the change in the blood pressure, and here's the number, you know, number of participants for a given change. You do get a distribution like this. Like anything else, you get a normal uh, Gaussian distribution. And this is, I mean, I've look, we've looked at our own data. Here's 85 subjects, it's small, but here are 85 subjects that we've put on a low sodium diet and a high sodium diet, normotensive subjects, young to middle age. And you can see that the um, change in mean arterial pressure for the participants varies tremendously. 
And actually where you draw the line and say, well, this is salt sensitive or this is salt resistant is quite arbitrary. You get a range of responses. But the point here is that there are multiple mechanisms that contribute ultimately to that blood pressure response. Um, now I want to move to target um, sodium and target organ uh, effects. So there are lots of, um, a lot of BP independent effects of high dietary sodium. And that's kind of the theme of, of the talk here. First with the brain, um, it's okay you can't see this well. This is more to prompt me than you don't have to worry about this. But um, high sodium, particularly in rodents, has, um, may sensitize sympathetic neurons. And an important area is the rostral ventral lateral medulla. And that's an area, um, those neurons are tonically active, they're barosensitive. And what they do is that's where they project to the preganglionic neurons, which ultimately lead to increases in efferent sympathetic activity. Now, this, these neurons here, these RVLM, rostral ventral lateral medulla, um, this area receives input from other brain centers, including the lamina terminalis. Now, this is the part of the brain that senses changes in osmolality and, ch and senses changes in sodium. So if you're increasing, if you're eating a lot of salt and your sodium goes up or it goes down, that's sensed in this area of the lamina terminalis, and that projects to the RVLM. So the thought is in the context of high serum or plasma sodium, that may work its way down to the RVLM, and you may have increased sympathetic outflow. And that's important in and of itself. I mean, in heart failure patients, with excessive sympathetic outflow, that's, a, that's related to mortality. So excessive sympathetic outflow can be bad. And also what's interesting is this is newer data. This is from my colleague Sean Stocker at Penn State Hershey. He's looked at this in rats, and these are salt-resistant rats. And he's looked at um, blood pressure variability. Um, so looking at the standard deviation of the systolic blood pressure while rats are on a low sodium diet for two weeks and a high sodium diet, lower high sodium chow. And he looks at the standard deviation as an index of blood pressure variability. But here are the st here's the standard deviation at day, during the day and at night. During the day, the rats are not very active. But at night, they're very active. And the point here is on high salt, they have increased blood pressure variability, even though they're salt resistant. And there's lots of evidence suggesting that increased blood pressure variability may be associated with target organ effects. And he thinks, and there's data showing, that that may work through that kind of the central mechanisms that I laid out. Sodium being sensed by the lamina terminalis, um, projections to the RVLM, causing an increase in sympathetic activity. But in any case, um, the point is that the brain may respond to high salt, and some of these sympathetic neurons may be sensitized and lead to things like increases in blood pressure variability. Now, with regard to the heart, we do know already that, of course, hypertension can lead to left ventricular hypertrophy. But there is some evidence suggesting that even in groups that have a low uh, prevalence of hypertension, that high salt is associated with increases in left ventricular, left ventricular mass. So even in the absence of hypertension, there's at least some evidence that high sodium in the diet can lead to increases in left ventricular uh, mass. And with regard to the kidney, and a lot of these effects are independent of blood pressure. With re regard to the kidney, um, there's data in spontaneously hypertensive rats. And this data shows if you load these rats with, you give them a lot of sodium, there are increases in renal vascular resistance, increases in glomerular pressure, increases in serum creatinine, and also proteinuria. So in these rats, um, high salt has a lot of uh, adverse effects. And there are also some data in people, um, in, in hyper black hypertensives, um, there are data showing that sodium restriction may decrease proteinuria, and also in patients with chronic kidney disease, if they, go, if they restrict their sodium, there may be less protein in the urine. Now, with regard to the blood vessels, this is where I'm going to spend a little bit of time. I'm going to share some of our data. Um, high salt may impair endothelial function and may increase arterial stiffness, and there's lots of evidence in rodents and animal studies, and also emerging and more and more evidence in people. And it's important to note that endothelial dysfunction is a precursor to atherosclerosis. And again, the point is a lot of this can be, a lot of these effects can be independent of blood pressure. So first, I'm going to talk about two of our studies. So I'm going to do a little bit of a deeper dive with these two studies. This first study was done by one of my former graduate students, Jody Graney. Dietary sodium loading impairs microvascular function independent of blood pressure, role of oxidative stress. So the purpose of this study uh, was to assess cutaneous microvascular function after dietary sodium loading in normotensive salt-resistant adults. Now, first, I want to give an explanation as to why we're studying the cutaneous microvasculature. 
Well, one is it's, it's easily accessible in people. Uh, two is the skin vasculature is regulated by the same vasoactive compounds as, as located elsewhere in the body. For example, nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is a potent vasodilator in the skin and also other areas of, of the body. And also, the skin microvascular just is thought to reflect the microcirculation in other tissues. But what we do is, um, and I'll explain the whole protocol, but just very briefly justifying the use of this cutaneous of the skin microvasculature, we use a technique. We use laser Doppler um, flowmetry. We place these laser Dopplers on the skin, and then we locally heat the skin. And when we locally heat the skin, we can elicit a vasodilation. And that vasodilation, that local vasodilation, reflects microvascular function. And also, we can get a little more sophisticated. We can put these little microdialysis fibers underneath the skin and infuse different substances. Like, for example, if we're interested in looking at the nitric oxide component to the dilation, we can quantify that by first infusing Ringer solution and quantifying the vasodilation, and then infusing L-name, which inhibits nitric oxide synthase, so that blocks nitric oxide, and the dilation goes down. But that difference is, is a way we can quantify that nitric oxide dilation. In any case, here are some, here are some pictures here. Um, instrumenting the skin, we use 25-gauge needles. The entry and exit points are about 2.5 centimeters apart, and we thread these small fibers underneath the skin. By the way, this is my arm. It doesn't hurt that much. Um, so we thread these microdialysis fibers, and these are the fibers that just underneath the skin that we can infuse different substances in. Um, here are the laser dopplers with the local heaters. This is showing three different sites. So we heat the local area, not whole body, just locally heat that small area and elicit a vasodilation. And what we get is, um, this is the response we get. This is the skin blood flow response over time. So we have baseline. Initially, it goes up dramatically. Then it comes down a little bit. And then we get a plateau. And that plateau, where it plateaus, that's our index of microvascular function. And then we infuse L-name. Block, that blocks nitric oxide synthase. So that allows us to determine the nitric oxide contribution. And that, um, when we infuse that, when we infuse the L-name, um, the dilation comes down dramatically. So the difference between here and here, I don't know if you can see my little arrow there, represents the, the component that's related to nitric oxide. Um, so this is our index of microvascular function. So here's our timeline to look at microvascular function while subjects are on a low and high salt diet. We have subjects go through a 21-day controlled diet, meaning all the food is prepared for them. The first seven days is a run-in period. And the run-in period contains 100 millimoles of sodium per day. And then they get randomized to either a high or low sodium diet. And the low is very low, and the high is very high in this study. The low is 20 millimoles per day. The high is uh, over 300 millimoles per day. For point of reference, 100 millimoles is 2,300 milligrams of sodium. And on the last day of each diet condition, we have them collect their urine for 24 hours. We have them wear an ambulatory blood pressure monitor so we get blood pressure every 20 minutes during the day, every 30 minutes at night, and then we, uh, we quantify that microvascular function by, cause, by doing the local heating and quantifying the dilation. Now, in this context, in, in this study, we were interested in looking at the, the, um, if these responses were independent of blood pressure. So we only tested those with salt-resistant blood pressure. And we define that as a change in blood pressure of less than 5 going from the low to high sodium diet. So all of these participants are salt resistant. If they were salt sensitive, we wouldn't, we wouldn't include them in this analysis because we wanted to get at, are these responses independent of blood pressure? So here's my, here's my arm again with three sites. But this is the protocol here. So the, we infuse Ringer solution. The first hour, we've got to wait after we uh, put the microdialysis fibers in. We have to wait for the hyperemia to, to go away. Then we collect some baseline data for a half hour. This is, um, we heat the skin, or we, the skin temperature is 33 degrees C. Then we turn up the heaters to 42 degrees C for over an hour to elicit that plateau. And then there's a lot of variability, so we, we index this to a site-specific maximum. And the way we get that is turn up the heaters a little more and drip in a little sodium nitroprusside, and that, that gives us a site-specific maximal dilation. But here is, um, so we have a ringer solution, 
Then we want to quantify at that site the contribution of nitric oxide. We infuse L name. And then also we were interested in looking at the potential role of oxidative stress. So we infuse some ascorbic acid through one of those microdialysis fibers. And ascorbic acid or vitamin C is used to quench oxidant species, including superoxide. So that gives us some insight as to whether oxidative stress is playing a role in these, uh, in these responses. So in this study, we had a, a dozen subjects, men and women. These were you know, fairly young, 30 years, 31 years old, normal BMI, and normal blood pressure. There's a lot here, but I simply want to point out, if we look at um, on the low-sodium diet, urinary sodium excretion was low. On the high-sodium diet, it was high, so they were following the diet. We have documentation of that when they collected their urine. Purposely, we didn't change potassium. We wanted potassium to be the same, so the foods that were prepared had the same amount of potassium. And importantly, there were no differences uh, between the low and high sodium diet with regard to blood pressure, whether it's 24-hour or laboratory the clinic blood pressure, so no, no difference in blood pressures. So these are truly salt-resistant um, individuals. So here are the results. Um, so again, just as a reminder, here's the, here are the responses. You have baseline, an initial peak, a plateau up here, and then it goes down near to the L name. And I show the bar graphs here of baseline, initial peak, plateau, and then the L name. And the black bars represent low sodium, and the open bars represent high sodium. And the point here is that under high sodium, there's less dilation. So there's less dilation under the high sodium condition in these salt-resistant subjects. Now, under the high salt condition, when we infuse ascorbic acid, you can see that's improved. So this is the depressed. This bar represents the depressed um, skin blood flow under the high salt condition. And when ascorbic acid is infused, it's improved. So that hints at that oxidative stress is playing a role in mediating the salt-induced decline in uh, microvascular function. So our conclusions here were in salt-resistant adults, the plateau phase of cutaneous vasodilation in response to local heating was attenuated during a high-salt diet. Uh, this was improved with the local infusion of ascorbic acid. And these findings indicate that salt, sodium-induced declines in microvascular function are independent of blood pressure since they're salt-resistant and suggest a role for oxidative stress in contributing to that impairment. Now, one more study I want to highlight. Um, we use the technique of flow media dilation to look at uh, function in the, in the brachial artery. So the purpose here was to determine if dietary sodium intake affects endothelium-dependent function independently of blood pressure. So here what we do is we image the brachial artery we get a log longitudinal image of the brachial artery, and we perform what's called a reactive hyperemia. We inflate this cuff to well over systolic blood pressure for five minutes. So we're, ba we're basically cutting off the circulation of the lower form just for five minutes. Release it, and when you release it, you get an increase in shear, and that causes nitric oxide to be released, and it causes the brachial artery to dilate. And we can quantify that dilation uh, by imaging the brachial artery. Kind of a simple way to look at that is once we release the cuff, we get an increase in flow or shear rate against the endothelial cells. This is representing endothelial cells. Here's the smooth muscle. So increase in shear causes nitric oxide to be released from the endothelial cells, causing a robust dilation. And we can quantify that dilation. And here's what we find. You can see this is the individual data, low sodium and high sodium. By and large, in the high sodium, the responses, the endothelium-dependent responses are less on the high sodium diet. You always get one subject that goes the other way, but, but um, um, this was statistically different, so there's a, there's a, a less endothelium-dependent dilation on the high sodium compared to the low sodium. We also, as is typical in studies like this, um, we also um, gave a, a in a subgroup of subjects, we administered a sublingual nitroglycerin tablet, 0.4 milligrams under the tongue, and you get a robust dilation with that, but that's independent of the endothelium. So when we do that, um, there are no differences between low salt and high salt. It's only with the increased shear and nitric oxide release that we see a difference between the uh, high sodium and the low sodium condition. So the conclusion, these data demonstrate that excess salt um, impairs endothelium-dependent dilation um, independently of changes in blood pressure. I did want to mention just briefly, we just published a paper where we looked at, where we compared responses in those that have salt-resistant blood pressure to those that have salt-sensitive blood pressure. And we hypothesized, actually, that for a given increase in dietary sodium, that those with salt-sensitive blood pressure would have more of a decline, but it really wasn't the case, in, at least in this subgroup. So in both groups, we had a decline going from low to high in the salt-resistant and in the salt-sensitive, but no difference.
And also we looked at this separately in men and women. Um, and you can see here that the open is men, the closed is women, and the high salt values, high dietary salt values are lower than the low. Um, but interestingly, the men had more of a decline for a given sodium load than the women. So for a given increase in sodium, men had more of a decline in flow-mediated dilation or endothelium-dependent dilation uh, than women. But we just published at this uh, just in 2014. We're not the only ones who've um, done studies like this. This is a group, um, this was published a few years ago, and rather than using a reactive hyperemia, what they do is they intra-arterially infuse um, acetylcholine. And when you infuse acetylcholine, you also get a release of nitric oxide and you get a dilation. And what they did, they did this under normal and high sodium conditions. And here are their data. So here are the acetylcholine, different doses of acetylcholine. This is the change in foreign blood flow using the technique of venous occlusion plethysmography. And you can see under the sodium loaded condition, at any dose of acetylcholine, the response was blunted. So this is large, this is consistent with what we found in our studies. And the point here, this is in young normotensive individuals. So with regard to salt, it's not just hypertension or blood pressure. Even these young normotensive individuals under high sodium conditions, um, that salt loading may impair vascular endothelial function. Okay, so now I want to move to dietary sodium, uh, blood pressure, and cardiovascular outcomes. So um, a few points here. So this is, moves into the epidemiology section here. So studying the effect of salt restriction on clinical outcomes raises significant challenges. And these include the assessment of sodium intake. So these are, you know, cohort or observational studies. The assessment of sodium intake. Often food frequency questionnaires are used, 24-hour recall, spot or urine collection, all of which have clear limitations in terms of assessing sodium. So that's a major problem in a lot of these studies. Um, Long-term maintenance of a defined salt intake regimen, also a challenge, and also the necessity for large um, numbers of patients and long-term follow-up and having enough patients to obtain outcomes for analysis. So these are all clear limitations in this literature. And Claudine has nicely summarized this, um, looking at a lot of the problems, the cohort study limitations, including systemic error in sodium assessment, as I just mentioned, potentially reverse causality, residual confounding, inadequate follow-up, random error in sodium assessment, and also insufficient power. So there are multiple, multiple limitations in, these, um, in a lot of these studies. I want to just highlight a few studies. First, I want to talk about blood pressure, then we'll talk about cardiovascular outcomes. So I picked this one. Um, I was going to pick the InterSalt study that goes back, but this one was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2014, um, and they looked at the associ association of urinary sodium and potassium with blood pressure. I'm ignoring potassium. I'm just going to talk about sodium. But this is the PURE study, the Prospective Urban Rural Epidemiology Study. The final sample was 102, over 102,000 participants. Uh, a few more than the dozen that we had in our physiology study, uh, 18 countries and four, representing five continents. Now, each participant provided a morning urine sample, and they estimated from that morning sample uh, the 24-hour urine. And again, there are clear limitations in doing that. So they only have a single urine sample, but they used a formula to estimate a 24-hour. Blood pressure was assessed uh, twice, and the mean sodium excretion was 4.9. Anyway, here are their data. So this is graphing urinary sodium excretion against systolic blood pressure. Now, they had a lot of participants from China in this study. So what they did was they graphed out the rest of the world and then China. But you can see there's a clear you know, association between as urinary sodium excretion um, is increased, so too is systolic blood pressure. Now, they spent a lot of time discussing uh, the slope of the response. And the slope is steeper in those that have higher sodium excretion. It's steeper in those that have hypertension. And it's also steeper in those um, that are older compared to those that are younger. And when I say steeper, I mean for a given change in urinary sodium excretion, how much systolic blood pressure is increased. Oh, and this was adjusted for age, sex, BMI, educational level, alcohol intake, and geographic region. So that shows a clear uh, relationship between urinary sodium excretion um, and systolic blood pressure. And it you know, parallels some data that were published many years ago with the InterSalt study. Now, looking at outcomes, this is a study by Nancy Ku um, using the, this was the uh, Trials of Hypertension Prevention. The purpose of this study, this was published in the British Medical Journal, to examine the effects of reduction in dietary sodium on cardiovascular events. Adults were aged 30 to 54 with prehypertension. Um, the interventions were dietary sodium reduction, 
comprehensive education and counseling for either 18 months in TOHP1 or 36 to 48 months in TOHP2. And this was long-term follow-up for uh, 10 to 15 years after the original trial. The main outcome was cardiovascular disease, MI stroke, revascularization, or, uh, or death. And here's what they found. This is cumulative index of cardiovascular disease. The red represents uh, the control. The red hatch represents the control, and the blue represents the sodium intervention. So you can see it's lower for both TOHP1 and TOHP2. The blue curves are lower than the uh, red curves. So they concluded that sodium reduction reduced long-term risk of cardiovascular events. And interestingly, it's, uh, blood pressure declined very little uh, in this trial. So um, they did another follow-up study, and this this comes from there were a lot. There's a lot of um, contradictory information out there looking at sodium intake and outcomes. So this was um, Nancy Cook. The background of this study is that some studies have raised the possibility of adverse effects of low sodium diet on cardiovascular disease, meaning less than 2,300 milligrams per day. And you've seen this in the newspapers, and there, this, this has received a lot of press, that, that possibility. So these according to Nancy Cook, these paradoxical findings might have resulted from suboptimal measurement of sodium and potential bias related to reverse causality. So in this study, um, the purpose was to assess cardiovascular events in participants in phases one and two of the trials of hypertension prevention. Now here, multiple assessments of 24-hour urine sodium excretion were analyzed, three to seven. So this is, they did a good job of assessing urinary sodium excretion. Participants in this analysis did not participate in an active sodium intervention. So this study has low potential, for, and, and this study has low potential for reverse causality because the cohorts were, were excuse me, were restricted to healthy prehypertensives. They weren't taking antihypertensive medications. And also, as I mentioned, there's a low potential for error in sodium assessment because they did multiple 24-hour urinary sodium excretion, which is the gold standard. Um, this is just their flow chart, but what they ended up was, they ended up with 2,275 unique participants and 193 cardiovascular disease events. And again, they took out those um, that were in a sodium intervention, and they wanted to get usual or normal sodium excretion in this cohort. And what this is their, this is the graph from, uh, from their, um, from their paper. And the point is that there's a, a relationship between sodium excretion and the hazard ratio for cardiovascular disease. And the big point here is, at least in this analysis, there was no evidence of a J-shaped relationship. So a lot of the controversy comes, is there a, quote, J-shaped relationship? In other words, under low sodium, do outcomes, you know, do people eating l less sodium have more problems than people eating a little more sodium? At least in this analysis, there was no evidence of that J-shape. And they had few less data here, but even this is going projecting down to less than 2,000 milligrams of sodium uh, per day. And they found a 17% increase per 1,000 milligrams per day increase in, uh, in sodium. Um, now, we talked about all the limitations with some of those cohort or observational studies. And I'm going to link back just to blood pressure just for a moment. And this is a study, this was published in 2001, and this was a randomized controlled trial, the so-called DASH studies. And I'm just focusing here on the sodium reduction. But this were, I think there were 412 participants. They participated in three different diets, 30 days each, and they had their blood pressure assessed. So, and, and again, this was a randomized crossover, so none of the limitations that we previously talked about for blood pressure. But in any case, going from eight to six to four, grams of salt per day, there was a decline in systolic blood pressure, and there was a decline in uh, diastolic blood pressure. And the, it, the decline differed for each group. For example, uh, black adults with hypertension going from eight to four had more of a decline than other participants with hypertension, and those with hypertension had more of a decline than uh, those without hypertension. And men, uh, women had more of a decline uh, than men going from eight to four. So there were some differences in the subgroups. But the point is, this is a randomized control sh trial showing very clearly that lowering salt in the diet does lead to a decline in blood pressure. Okay, now um, I'm going to move to limiting sodium in the diet. Um, now, I wish I could, it would be nice if we could just say, you know, stay away from the salt lick or stay away from the salt shaker and all is good. But as everyone knows, approximately 70% of sodium in the diet is in processed foods. Um, average consumption in the U.S. is more than 3,200 milligrams per day. NHANES data has shown that sodium intake has increased, and NHANES data has shown that 97% of U.S. adults are consuming more sodium than recommended, so everyone. 
Um, so approaches to decreasing dietary sodium. Well, lots of approaches. Decrease the sodium content of foods, having consumers switch to low sodium foods, avoiding processed foods, reading labels, switching to substitute salts. Uh, you know, somehow we got to reduce sodium while increasing other flavors, and also perhaps using engineering approaches to provide a salty taste with less sodium. But the point here is, um, it's tough. I mean, a decrease in sodium intake from current levels, current U.S. levels, uh, will represent a major change in our food supply. And clearly, to do something like this, there has to be coordination between food processors, restaurants, and advocacy groups. Um, again, it's not enough just to avoid the salt shaker because all the salt is in all the other foods that we that we eat. So now I'm going to um, I'm going to leave time for questions. I'm going to move to conclusions. So first, my visual conclusion. Here we have prolonged uh, high sodium high sodium chloride intake can lead, of course, to increases in arterial blood pressure. But clearly, it's beyond just increases in blood pressure. High salt intake can affect the kidney, can affect the heart, and can clearly affect the blood vessels, even in the absence of increases in blood pressure. And my you know, more traditional conclusion, so BP correlates with sodium intake with multiple mechanisms underlying this relation. High dietary sodium adversely affects multiple target organs independent of blood pressure. Clinical trials have shown decreased blood pressure with decreased sodium intake. Studies relating sodium consumption to cardiovascular events have significant limitations, but there is some evidence that lowering sodium has health benefits. And reducing sodium will take a coordinated effort involving you know, not-for-profit organizations, food producers and processors, restaurants, and public uh, policy aimed at, uh, at education. So dietary sodium and health, clearly, at least you know, from my read, it's clearly more than just uh, blood pressure. So I want to acknowledge my uh, again my colleagues Claudine and Bill Claudine Jerkovitz and Bill Weintraub, my colleague uh, Dave Edwards, as well as my students and my funding. So thank you for your attention. So any comments? Yes. So it's uh, uh, terrific. I think I've seen some of this before. Might have, yeah. <laughs> so can we can we entirely dis disregard the J-shaped curve that's seen in epidemiologic studies. Uh, and the argument that's used for it is, well, if you lower sodium too much, you're, you're turning on uh, the, the, uh, the renin angiotensin yeah, system, uh, and you're, you're uh, going to en end up with a, a paradoxical um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, effect. So, so, so what do you think? Can, can we disregard it? Um, what, what, and how do, we, how do we deal with it epidemiologically? So, um well, I said my questions are more in my wheelhouse than yours. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Well, I, I was going to say something like that. I would ask an epidemiologist or someone that studies outcomes. <laughs> no, um, I think, um, well, I mean, I, I think we have the same opinion here. I mean, I think um, clearly, I mean, if you, if you volume deplete someone and, you know, have them eat, you know, just a few hundred milligrams of sodium per day, um, renin's going to go through the roof, angiotensin II is going to go up, you'll have sympathetic nervous system activity going, going to go up. But that's in a low sodium, volume depleted type state. And you don't see that, you know, I don't think, and this is where maybe there's some contradictory, and going from, you know, going from 3,200 milligrams per day, which is what we, you know, the United States consumes, going to 2,300. And most of the organizations fall somewhere between, um, between 1,500 and 2,300 milligrams per day would be recommended. So I don't think you get that robust, you know, activation um, of the renin angiotensin system or sympathetic outflow going from 32 to, you know, for example, 23 or 2,000 milligrams per day. So that would be that would be one point. You know, I think in terms of those studies with the with the quote J shape, and again, you, you can speak better than I can. But I mean, I think it's a lot of it can be the the the, the reverse causality, and that's um, you know the reverse causality. If you have these big big studies and you have participants in them with you know heart failure, heart disease, chronic kidney disease, perhaps diabetes, perhaps hypertension. If you have subjects in those studies, um, and if those subjects are consuming less sodium for any number of reasons, maybe someone told them because they have a problem they should consume less sodium, or maybe they're sick and they're, they're, um, they're eating fewer calories, and if they're eating fewer calories, they're gonna eat less sodium. But what that does is it sets up a, um, an inverse relationship between sodium and um, the outcome. 
And if you have that, inver in that, that inverse relation between sodium and outcome is really a reflection of their disease, not the fact that they're eating less sodium. So that, that would be the right, that's the reverse causality. So I think a lot of the literature, and it's fun reading this literature because there are a lot of strong opinions on this as we've, you know, as we, we've, we've gone through a lot of this literature together. Um, so I think a lot of the people tend to disregard, I think, some of the pure analyses because they think reverse, reverse causality could play a role. And I know they've done some, they've made some efforts to kind of minimize that. Um, but also in some of the, you know, the pure analysis, you know, the, the, the key issue, uh, uh, maybe a more important issue is assessing sodium intake in these, you know, studies with 100,000 participants. And it probably, it's not, it's probably not good enough to do a spot urine in the morning and extrapolate that out to 24 hours and just have one. I mean, 24-hour urine is the gold standard. I mean, I can even tell you, even doing a 24-hour urine, I mean, we do controlled feeding studies. So we're providing foods to people for, you know, one week high, one week low, and we measure 24-hour urine. Even when we do that, there's a tremendous amount of variability. So really to get a usual sodium intake, the only way to really do it in these large studies, and it's difficult, is to do multiple 24-hour multiple 24-hour urines. And I think that's the benefit of like the, the analysis that Nancy Cook did in the trials of hypertension prevention. And maybe I'm a bill or Claudine if you want to comment. But I think that's a major limitation of these studies as well. So I mean I don't know if I mean I think we could disregard some of those studies, but I don't know. I mean I think it's well it's hard, you know, it's hard to disregard uh, science set. I just totally think it's wrong. But yeah. you know I think you've hit all of the all of the major points. But what I would emphasize is uh, that when people are, are sick, they eat less, and there's a strong correlation between how much people eat yes. and salt. Right. Uh, and so um, it's not a matter of people going on a low-salt diet when they mm -hmm. get sick. It's a matter of as people get sick, they eat less. Right, right. I think that, that's a, that alone is enough to explain the the, uh, the, the yeah. implication. And I think a lot of you know, recommendations, and it's based on the limitations that we discussed that were nicely uh, summarized by, uh, by Claudine, in our article, but I mean, a lot is, you know, we know blood pressure is an important variable, and we have, I think, a lot of confidence, whether it's, you know, some of these epidemiology studies or even like the, the um, DASH diet, that lowering sodium will lower, will lower blood pressure. So I think nothing else we can rely on um, benefits of sodium reduction and contributing to lower blood pressure. Other questions or comments? Yes. In your second slide, I think it was, it, it gave groups that had that were at risk for high blood pressure. Yes. Why are low birth weight babies? Uh, birth weight. Yeah. Um, I think it might be related to lower renal mass, maybe. Claudine, do you yeah, know? I think, so. I think the low birth weight is associated with uh, lower renal mass, and that may be a reference to a higher. So that slide was. Um, groups that tend to have higher salt sensitivity and emphasizing there's a lot of variability in there, not like every person with, um, every older person has salt sensitive blood pressure. But um, yeah, I think it's lower renal. Do you, know. you want to add to that, Claudine? I don't know. That's, what, that's my recollection. Again, women with a history of preeclampsia, there were several groups that have been shown to have high salt sensitivity. Are you saying the preeclamptic mothers are more prone to have salt sensitive uh, children, babies? Is that what you're saying? No. So women with a history of preeclampsia are more likely to be salt sensitive. Yeah. Okay. And that study I know a little bit about. So that one, what they did was um, they assessed salt sensitivity um, in women 10 years after delivery, but in women who had severe preeclampsia. And when they assessed salt sensitivity 10 years later, the women compared, it was a case control study, the women that had severe preeclampsia had, had, had more salt sensitivity. And it was interesting in that study as well, they also looked at under high salt conditions, women with a history of preeclampsia had a less of a, a nighttime dip in blood pressure, which seems to also be important as well. Those that don't dip as well at night seem to have worse outcomes. But it wasn't their children, it was the actual the women who had preeclampsia. But I think there were some studies looking at blood pressure in infants in, in the U.S. Mm -hmm. compared to other countries and found that routine of healthy babies, mm -hmm. I'm talking about healthy babies, um, elevated blood pressures, high normal mm -hmm. blood pressures, and it was due to a lot of salt in the formula, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and the formula that they uh, feed in the U.S. And uh, the argument being made was the advocation for more breastfeeding, mm -hmm. and apparently the formulas are poorly configured to actually promote this hypertension at a very early 
Right, that's too bad. Yeah. So, I mean, so, you know, I think that part of it's reflecting the epidemiologic, the lack of randomized trials and events. Yes. And epidemiologic studies that say, well, you need a, you need a certain amount of, of, of sodium in your diet, and you end up with terrible public policy like this. I mean, the amount of sodium is homeostasis. I mean, it's very low. We don't need a whole lot. <laughs> so, uh, you know, in terms of the um, people of, um, of African descent, uh, in terms of their relationship to, there have been some theories put out there, and I just one. And one has to do with, um, you look at it from an epidemiologic During the Middle Passage, um, the challenge was you had a lot of folks in close proximity, mm -hmm. high disease rate, a lot of diarrhea, dehydration. <laughs> and so essentially you were self-selecting those who could maintain adequate volume right, right. during the trip. Mm -hmm. And so the, um, uh, the prevalence of hypertension in African Americans in particular, mm -hmm. uh, because when you go to uh, I haven't looked at this carefully, so if I'm off, please. No, I, I, I don't know a lot about this, but I've read the same type of explanation. Um, if you go to places uh, in Africa, you find that the hypertension rates aren't necessarily the same mm -hmm. as they are for African Americans. Now, true, they eat more natural fruit. There's not a lot yeah. of processed food. But the, um, uh, so the thought was these salt retainers mm -hmm. uh, were able to survive. <laughs> Right, the passage they could survive those those massive uh, infections and, mm -hmm. and diarrhea, and, diarrhea. and that, hence you have this genetic predisposition, almost in the way that malaria selects out sickle cell. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sickle cell people survive malaria, uh, mm -hmm. and so um, uh, just so I'm just muting yes. out loud. Yeah, no, I, I I've read the same thing. It seems that makes some sense. I mean, the only real, I mean, the only data I know of is really linked to, um, you know, alterations in uh, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. I know a group from the UK, E and McGregor um, and others have looked at, you know, they've put, and I'm not sure if this fits into that thinking or not, but they put individuals on, you know, low and high sodium diets, they quantify the hormonal response, and they show that those that have a, quote, less responsive renin angiotensin aldosterone system are more likely to have salt-sensitive blood pressure. And I guess the context there is you can think, um, I guess you can think whether you're increasing or decreasing sodium. If you're if you're increasing sodium in the diet, you're doing like a perturbation. You expect those hormones to be suppressed. So if you're not able to adequately suppress, and you have more angiotensin II circulating, and in the context of the expanded extracellular fluid volume, that may lead to a salt sensitive blood pressure response. So I don't know how that fits into that, but that that those are the only data I know of. Um, although there's also some with um, the uh, smooth muscle response, like the, the, if you expand the extracellular fluid volume, increase cardiac output, that's going to drive up blood pressure. And it's thought that um, in some individuals, they're not they're not able to um, sort of dilate in the vasculature. And if you can't dilate in the vasculature, you can't offset that increase in cardiac output. Um, that may also lead to an increase in blood pressure. And that's been uh, there's a group in San Francisco. I can't think. Is out there, but they've shown that um, that mechanism may play an important role in a high prevalence of salt sensitivity and blood pressure in African Americans. So, you so know, those are knows, the only data. I mean, who knows why we have more salt sensitivity in, 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 in African Americans? But then, and I've heard this, this middle passage argument before as, as well, exactly as you articulated it. Um, but the other side of that is, is the, the notion that there's not a lot of hypertension in, in, in Africa is wrong. I was say, I'm not, I'm not. That's wrong. Okay. Lots, Why lots, did lots. Say, right. you know, I don't know the numbers if it's as high as it is here, but you know, you have different diets and other things going on as well, but yeah. there's, a, there's, a, there's a big problem in Africa. But mostly in, in related to urbanization, I think. Yes, but that's precisely the point. Right. As they become more urban, they're becoming, they're becoming more like us. I mean, what I learned when I was in the... <laughs> uh, one thing I always have to check myself is, you know, there are 50-some-odd countries there. Mm -hmm. a lot of dietary variants. Yeah. Um, but uh, you're absolutely correct. When I was in Sierra Leone, you know, Chinese food restaurants, mm -hmm. high, high sodium mm -hmm. thing, and I'm, you know, and 
Uh, and so the, um, but however, when you go out to the more remote areas, mm -hmm. food is more in fresh, is, mm -hmm. you know, it's right off the farm and it's probably more appropriate. <laughs> Other comments or questions? Thanks very much. I appreciate the questions and thank you.